Hey, how's it going? So, uh, I don't know about all of you, but my brain kind of hurts after the last few talks, so hopefully this will kind of give you a little chance to relax. Plus, I think T-Max strategically put us at three to make sure everybody had plenty of big Punisher in them before we get up here. So, uh, so the title of the talk is How President Trump's 400-Pound Hacker Bypasses Security. Um, I'm, I'm sure, given the audience and the community that we're in, y'all kind of remember at the time, Mr. Trump, in one of the debates, made the comment regarding the DNC hack that, you know, it could have been the Russians, it could have been China, or it could have been the 400-pound hacker on his bed. So that's kind of the context of the talk. So this is what happens when you let your co-presenter do the last iteration of the slides. But I'm Ben Clark. Um, I work for Millennium Corporation. Uh, prior to that, I spent some time up here in Maryland working where probably a lot of you work. But I've been in Huntsville, Alabama now for a little over eight years. And I kind of oversee our red team cyber operations uh, cell within the company, doing both commercial and federal uh, government customers. So. Um. I'm Matt Hulse. I have like a completely different background than Ben. Um, I started with the uh, Air Force Red Team and was a technical lead there until 2011 or so, then went to be a pen tester for Verizon, tested banks and financial companies and banks and movie theaters and banks and SCADA and banks. Um, so got kind of tired of that, had the opportunity to come uh, work at Millennium. Uh, we're kind of like the uh, best Red Team you guys have never heard of. So that's who I am. Okay, so the purpose of the talk, um, like we said, we do penetration tests and red teaming. So this talk is focused on kind of bypassing security products from an operational perspective. So kind of in the context of how you would perform a red team mission. Uh, so it's there's not really discussion of how you would exploit security products. It's just kind of uh, living off the land, leveraging tools that are at your discretion or kind of known techniques to actually get around security products in the environment without being detected. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a low-tech presentation. Um, Matt will kind of go into a little bit of custom stuff, but it's uh, kind of leveraging, as I said, kind of what's at your disposal uh, to kind of bypass the products and then gain some kind of execution or get to a place where you can have some kind of impact for the operation. So, so it turns out the, the DNC hack was not a 400 pound hacker. Um, CrowdStrike put out a report, I'm guessing probably a, a good bit of you have actually seen the report, uh, but they actually attributed it to a couple different um, adversaries. They named them Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear. Um, kind of Russian attributed actors that CrowdStrike uh, tracks. So a few of the um, kind of things within the report, which we'll kind of have weave through some of the presentation is some of the techniques that these two particular APTs used in the DNC hack. Um, so you can see a little bit here, but some of it was, um, they do have custom implants that they were using, but some of the mechanisms they had where they would deploy it or kind of gain some kind of uh, privilege escalation, lateral movement, some of the techniques they used, um, you know, they leveraged some open source public uh, techniques. So for instance, they used Mimikatz to do cred credential gathering and lateral movement uh, through the network. Um, one of the other things, they, I mean, they used a heavy bit of a PowerShell through it, so they did a lot of download and execute and uh, kind of encoded PowerShell um, commands that they would use for some of their uh, attack techniques. And then, we'll, like I said, we'll hit on it a little bit later, but they would use a lot of um, in-memory techniques. So, you know, they would use run DLL32 to load uh, kind of their custom DLL into memory and do whatever execution they needed from there. So to kind of add to this security vendor's challenge, it's kind of like a cat and mouse game, right? Where a lot of it's signature based and something will come out, they'll have to modify, update signature files and that kind of thing uh, to kind of keep up with the, with the different type of attack vectors people are using. So um, it, it's definitely a hard problem and to kind of compound that challenge, you have probably thousands of pen test companies now, you know, 
so many security researchers doing presentations such as kind of what we heard today. And you know, I was kind of preparing for the talk and just doing some research and ran across a pen testing blog or forum where somebody just posted something like, hey, I can get around almost every security product having some trouble with, with uh, Kaspersky and need some help. And you know, you just have everybody injecting different techniques that they use in you know pen test settings or whatever. So they use PyDEXE, which was also used as part of that um, uh, CrowdStrike report that they had in there. So PyDEXE, you know, obviously with Metasploit and and those kind of open source tools, uh, there's a lot of ways to encode payloads and those kind of things uh, that kind of have a lot of, of they're very effective in some cases. And then if none of that works, you can use quantum attacks to get past Kaspersky, but that's way above my level. So now I'll t turn it over to Matt. All right, uh, so originally we'd kind of had one format for this presentation that was gonna follow the flow of, of kind of like our pen testing and red teaming methodology. Um, that's kind of fell to the wayside. So some of these slides work with it. Some of these slides are kind of like, okay, that came out of nowhere, but uh, that's why this slide is called pre-op. These are kind of the things to think about before you start uh, any operation, at least as far as uh, I'm concerned when it comes to uh, red teaming and stuff. First is um, custom is always best. If you have the means to develop custom C2 and you have the means to uh, develop and implement um, any kind of custom tool on your end, that's great, go for it. Uh, the alternative to that is living off the land and using what's available on the machine. The things that you want to kind of avoid if possible are the big name brand uh, pen testing tools that are out there. Um, Metasploit, uh, Empire, what, Cobalt? Yeah, Cobalt Strike, um, things like that. If you can avoid that, um, I would, and we'll get into a slide here in a little bit that kind of talks more about that. Um, I always take the stance that if a human is looking at what I'm doing, then it's already game over. So I'm not too big a uh, person on like trying to pack my executables or trying to obfuscate them or do things that would make uh, these uh, things difficult to find and see because it takes time out of my day trying to do that stuff and it doesn't in the end help anybody. But again, this is from a red team perspective. So there's some expectation that the customer will um, not like take our stuff and ship it off to AV or anything like that. So let's see, uh, executing baby steps. That's just because so many times I see people uh, build their entire C2 infrastructure, fire their first phishing emails, and nothing seems to be working. They know that uh, everything's good, but because they didn't take the time to step through everything that they were doing, they fat fingered an IP address in the initial C2 setup, and that's why nothing's working. It's got nothing to do with AV. It's got nothing to do with really smart users that won't do any spear phishing uh, campaigns or anything like that. It's simply because they screwed up. So, uh, what's the others? Yeah, infrastructure is cheap, so don't stay in the same place. This comes into the executing and baby steps, and then as we start to talk about uh, some of the sandboxing and things like that, what you want to do is um, maybe conduct your assessments in phases, and that includes um, you where you launch your attacks from. So I might send, and we'll talk about it here in a minute, uh, I might send a first phishing email to gather some information. I, that's time to change infrastructure and come from somewhere else for the next phishing email that might be trying to get you uh, some kind of initial foothold or access into the network. And okay, gather intel from everywhere. I, I've always put this slide or always put this bullet in here, and I always mention you know looking at job postings and stuff for security products that are in use. And I don't think I've ever once actually done that. Uh, but other things you can do or look at. Uh, security product vendors and stuff like that, especially if you test like uh, large companies or Fortune 100 companies, security product vendors love to brag who's using their products. So you can generally find that. It's a little more like a reverse approach to figuring out products that are in use, but that's just some good open source uh, means to get information. Okay, so <clears throat> now that we've kind of talked about some of that uh, initial stuff, let's talk about getting access, uh, our first foothold into our target environment. The easiest thing you can do is bypass all of it together, and if you have the means to access and do social engineering or physical access to a system, that's going to save you all a whole world of, of hurt and trying to set up and conduct phishing campaigns. But that's not always an option, and I understand that. So social engineering options that have worked for me in the past, um, I wind up getting VPN credentials, and I'm able to just connect into a network and bypass all um, 
layered security there because I'm coming in as a trusted user. So just pick up the phone and call somebody if that's part of your engagement. That's always worked really well for me. Uh, the other option is physical access. Again, that's generally not in scope on some engagements. Kind of depends on the client, but uh, you can get on site and directly plug in with a, like a root and boot CD that just boots up the machine and goes ahead and creates an extra user account for you or direct memory attacks with um, Thunderbolt Fire, uh, what, Thunderbolt Firewire, PCMCIA, Express Card, stuff like that. Given that those options generally don't work out, then we turn to phishing, which is still the most prominent and successful form of initial foothold. So there's a couple of different types of phishing emails that I like to use, mostly uh, weaponized attachments, but you can also do like a, emails that don't have those kinds of attachments, the ones that send people with links to click on and places to go, but uh, the weaponized attachments are the ones that I personally prefer the best. So <clears throat> if we're gonna go that route and use weaponized office documents, um, you could, I guess you could have like PDFs with exploits and stuff, but that's not so common anymore. But uh, macro enabled workbooks and stuff like that have always proven very successful for me. Uh, but what I like to do is focus on gathering some kind of data and telemetry with my documents. So we were on a test um, probably three or four years ago and we would send phishing emails and they'd be successful. We'd get an initial foothold into a network and then after about a day or so, we'd lose that access. We'd do it again and we'd do it again and we'd do it again. And it was the same thing every single time. Um, after probably the fifth or sixth time of this happening, we decided that we would send this uh, phishing email, but we'd also have the office document when they opened it, have it connect back to us and leave us data. So well, one of the things we were noticing during the test was that we would get two callbacks from our weaponized document. It'd reach out to our C2 server, pull down the implant twice, but it only ever executed once. And we, so we'd get the callback that we were wanting, but we'd get burned out of the network at the, about the same time. So then we started collecting data. We'd send back like the username um, of the running user that opened the, the uh, document. We'd send back data about the path that it was in, the machine name, anything we could get our hands on, we'd send that back in query strings back to our C2 server. And we started noticing that there were certain things there that we could detect. Um, yeah, so that was always very useful for us. Another uh, technique was like, um, using beef on the back end to receive and profile like anybody that clicks a link and gather all that kind of data from there as well. All right, so for the evasion piece of this, once you've gathered all this information, now it's time you can start actually kind of uh, trying to work through and invade the uh, sandbox that you might be running in. So you use that tele uh, telemetric data that you've got. These sandboxing products have limits. Uh, Alex did a fantastic job of running down those limits uh, earlier, way more than things that I would have thought of. But uh, for us, it was just, let's gather usernames and, and material like this. And we were starting to see like, you know, the products that we were running into had um, usernames like user or administrator, things that just didn't make sense based on the target environment we were going with. We'd get back the Active Directory domain name, there wouldn't be one. Well, we knew our target environment, we knew exactly what the domain we were targeting, so that was funny. Um, all kinds of other metrics that we were able to get back as well. So you're definitely something that you can signature. Uh, we also noticed that the macros that we'd set up in these, uh, we were using Excel files at the time, um, weren't successful in everything. Like uh, when the workbook opened, everything that we wanted to run ran, but when they went to close the workbook, we weren't seeing any of that happen, which was telling us that the, uh, san uh, that the sandbox was just destroying the VM and not allowing it to close like it was supposed to. So it wasn't running any of the on-close functions that we wanted. All right, so what we did um, for us in this case was we put all of our code um, inside of a basically a conditional that just looked to see what the username was. If the username was user, then we just didn't run anything at all. That was simple enough to get us around uh, the sandbox. Other options that we could have explored, um, application wait. I don't really like this option. This lets us kind of like 
pause the execution of the macro until the sandbox gets destroyed. But if the user closes the Office document at the same time, then we lose it. Uh, you could do it in the uh, document close or before close uh, function, and that would work, but haven't really tried it. And then we had the encrypted macros concept from, from uh, Secure State that I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, basically, the idea is if you know information about the environment you're going against, such as the username you're targeting or the Active Directory domain name that you're targeting, use that as an XOR and as like an XOR cipher key and just uh, encrypt the payload that you're getting ready to run. And then when it runs in the sandbox, that will be incorrect. It'll pull the environment variable for that information. It won't match, uh, it won't decrypt, and it won't execute. Now, the only thing that I didn't really uh, like about this particular um, approach is that the way that it called uh, what it was decrypting was basically a PowerShell one-liner, and no matter what, it tried to run that string even if it didn't decrypt successfully. So I would put some other kind of conditional in there that checked to make sure that that string actually turned out how it was supposed to before it tried to uh, execute. All right, so like I said, we kind of uh, had a format in mind at the beginning of this, and then there's supposed to be a huge transition of amazement here. But <clears throat> since there isn't, we'll, we'll move on. Once you have that initial successful connection, um, then it's time to persist on the box. It's time to uh, um, maintain that access and, and uh, start to plan your lateral movement throughout the network. Uh, one thing that we see with a lot of people that use Metasploit and stuff like that is that they tend to lose access uh, because their Metasploit templates that they use really aren't uh, up to snuff. So if you're using Metasploit, uh, the default templates that come with it are really not your friend. That's not something that you want to use. They're already signatured by, uh, actually they're signatured by way more than that once they have a payload in it. So on the left here is the default um, template for the uh, executable, standard executable, not the service, not the DLL, but the standard executable. Um, that's what it looks like in code. Uh, what's already compiled with it has been compiled and has been known by VirusTotal since 2010. Um, there are 12 AV vendors that detect that code in its compiled form uh, just right out of the box, which is kind of crap because there's really nothing malicious about that code in its current form. There's no payload actually in it. It's just that empty template, but those 12 uh, vendors seem to think it's something bad. So then we decided to kind of take a look at what else we could do to kind of get around more AV products than uh, kind of improve our odds of getting around everything. So we started out with um, with the template that I showed you. Then we took that template, went ahead and compiled, uh, went ahead and injected a standard interpreter reverse HTTPS callback into it. That got detected, what, 47? Uh, 47 AV products detected that one. So then we started uh, working on it some more. We recompiled the template just so that it would have a different template than the original one. We didn't make any changes to the code, just recompiled the template and uh, ran it again. That still got detected 36 times. So after that, we, um, I'm trying to see this closer. Yeah. All right, so then after that, if you saw in the code before, there's that comment field there. We just injected uh, or just put in jailbreak security summit in there, recompiled, made sure that the string was actually there and wasn't stripped out because it's not used for anything. It was still there. Um, recompiled that and ran it, still 34. Uh, detections. So our odds started improving once we started mixing, uh, started really changing the way that template functions. One thing we did was print the template, uh, print that comment string out to the console before we ran the payload. That again improved our odds marginally, got us the 26 out of 61. But our best success was to uh, mix things up significantly, get away from the template altogether, and what we did was inject the uh, reverse HTTPS callback into um, WordPad. We took a WordPad standard Windows binary, injected it into there. That got us past all but two products, uh, Baidu and CrowdStrike, Falcon, XL, that, no, ML, something like that. Those are the only two products that were successful in detecting uh, that modified implant. CrowdStrike gave it about a 64% confidence. So then just to see what kind of odds we had if we went all the way away from 
what Meterpreter and Metasploit and all that provides, threw together a real quick custom implant that was about uh, 60 lines of C sharp um, and ran that through and CrowdStrike was the only product to detect us there with a 63% confidence. Uh, that custom implant basically looks like this. The 60 lines total, most of that's curly braces, um, but <clears throat> Up at the top is, is the bulk of the download piece to connect to our outside C2 server. And then the code on the uh, right there is to execute it. On the far left at the bottom there, that is what our C2 server is returning. If you were to visit that site, it's not HTML, it's not, there's no head, there's no body, it's simply that string. And then it just gets passed to cmd.exe to run on the box. In its current form, obviously not impressive at all, but if we change that to a PowerShell one-liner of some kind, we can then download something into memory and start running from there. And we've effectively bypassed pretty much uh, all AV products. I'm really confident that with a little more time, a little more effort, maybe two, 300 more lines of code, that CrowdStrike would not uh, detect this either, so. So we'll shift gears a little bit here and kind of get into code signing certificates. So as, as Windows has implemented new security features such as AppLocker and with Windows 10 device card, which we'll talk about here in a slide or two, um, you know, completely unsigned malware isn't as effective as it used to be. I mean, so, you know, malware authors and us in the kind of red team community had to kind of look at different mechanisms we could use to, to try and bypass when there are um, code signing restriction, restrictions for applications. Um, so, um, in the context of AppLocker, which we'll talk about in a second, um, one of the things that we would look to do is just use whatever the trusted binaries are and it might be a kind of unintended um, functionality within it, but you would just kind of use, again, kind of what's there and available. Um, one kind of interesting report I ran across, it was from IBM X-Force, I think it was from 2015. They put a uh, report together um, kind of going over um, kind of banking trojans and malware and kind of dart web and all that kind of stuff. But they uh, kind of coined this certificates as a service. And they actually found a few sites where stolen uh, code certificates were just being sold on the black market, on the dark web. And you could go buy one for a couple hundred bucks or something um, that you could then use to sign your, your code, your malware. So when we get into application whitelisting, um, specifically kind of in this context and some of the examples here, uh, it's dealing with Microsoft AppLocker um, is what we were looking at. So um, Casey Smith um, did a couple of presentations and he's got a, a bunch of blog posts about it where he did some good research on, a pretty thorough research on just application bypassing, application whitelisting bypassing. So he did a ShmooCon talk back in 2015 and then he's got a, a Git repo out there that he's got a bunch of uh, uh, kind of scripts and different mechanisms to do things. So one of those, he calls it all the things, but it's just a DLL that he's built that has five different uh, kind of app locker bypasses that he did some research on and are known to work. Um, I won't cover all of them, but one of the most interesting one is the first one there, the RedServe32. So you know, it's, it's a Microsoft binary. Uh, default, it's in the .NET load, so as long as you have that, it should be on the box. And kind of one of the interesting things that he found is you could give it this slash I uh, parameter and then feed it a, a um, HTTP or HTTPS URL. And it'll actually go out and download a script file that you put in and it will, reg 32 will load it into memory and actually execute it for you. So you don't even have to host anything on the box that could get picked up by AV or a different security product you can just give it the URL you want it to download and do it that way. One of the nice things about RegServe32 is it's proxy aware, uh, uses TLS. So, you know, if you're in the user context and proxy is configured, you know, it, it should be good to go. 
there were, there were a couple other interesting ones. Um, obviously, one of the ones he did there, there at the bottom was the run DLL 32, just to load a custom DLL, which kind of going back again to the CrowdStrike report is definitely kind of a, a, a known technique that an APT would potentially use. Um, so. And the next one, uh, so AppLocker is still available on Windows 10, but they kind of created a new product called Device Guard. And they also have another one called Credential Guard as well. But uh, for this, we'll kind of focus on Device Guard. And if it's fully configured, it actually has uh, kernel and user mode code integrity uh, capabilities within it. The kernel mode uses a virtualization security um, platform, so there are some hardware requirements for like BIOS and firmware and a couple other things, um, trusted platform chip and some of those to get it set up and configured um, as well as software. But what it uses is everything's enforced for the user mode code integrity through code integrity policies. So obviously these are configurable, um, kind of in its current state, device guard doesn't have any kind of um, user interface. It's pretty uh, cumbersome to try and configure, so they'll probably upgrade that at some point in the future. But just kind of out of the box default, if you, again, can use a Microsoft sign binary that you can feed it some kind of script or code or payload or something else and it could execute it for you, then obviously you're getting around any kind of um, code integrity checks and that kind of thing. So a, a couple got Casey Smith again, and then Matt Graber did some research on how you could bypass device guard. And uh, these are kind of two examples that they pulled out was using, uh, for Matt Graber, he said you could either use WinDebug, but which would require some kind of you know active GUI, or you could actually use CDB from the command line to feed it a script file and then actually take that, execute it in the context of some other process. So in the example here, he has a custom script file that he loads into Notepad and it actually runs the code for you as a trusted Microsoft binary. Um, Casey Smith, did a, he did a similar thing using MS Build. So MS Build, you can create these inline tasks. And same thing, using MS Build, which is with default.net, you feed it a script file and it'll actually load script file in, or take the C-sharp C code, compile it, load it into memory, and then it executes within the, uh, the uh, MS build process, essentially. Um, like I said, it, it's highly configurable, and Matt Graber did put out some kind of mitigation rules for it. The uh, executables down on their bottom are potential executables that can launch your code for you that are Microsoft signed binaries. Um, so he put some, you know, some of those code integrity policies together that you know would kind of restrict using these kind of tools. Right. So a few more thoughts that um, that we kind of had that we thought we'd bring up. Um, if you are developing your own custom uh, C2, your own custom tools and things like that, there are a lot of things that I think are important to consider uh, when you're doing that. Uh, they all kind of fall into the idea of being dynamic, being specific to the system that you're running on. So if you look at the processes names that you're running, the registry keys you're polling, the, the names on disk, the mutexes you create, all those kind of things, the pipes that you generate, make those specific and tailored to the environment that you're in. Uh, and then post that information back to your C2 platform. So especially if you have staged persistence on a system where, or in an environment I should say, where you have one stager you know, that starts the uh, persistence process up and then it invokes the next stage and things like that, keep those stages encrypted on disk but keep the keys to them on your C2 server. That way if someone's really wanting to look at some of your larger payload sets don't, uh, you don't wind up losing any of that to a malware uh, analyst or anything like that. So. All right, um, privilege escalation. We've had some circumstances where that hasn't worked out very well for us, uh, especially Mimikatz and trying to inject into LSAS and stuff like that. Uh, one thing that we've found that's been very useful for us to get around it is to take uh, sys internals tools like proc dump and just dump the LSAS process to disk and then post it back um, to our 
uh, C2 infrastructure, bring it back home, and then we can use Mimikatz offline to dump uh, everything out of memory. Um, if that's not an option and you can't get the dumps to work or you don't have uh, sufficient access, there's a particular product that comes to mind that will prevent you from injecting into LSAS and, project and prevent you from doing these kind of things. Um, if that's not an option to you, user land key loggers still work very well, especially on admin workstations where they're command line proficient and they're constantly um, making net use connections and, and talking to other systems and typing in their password uh, outside of UAC prompts and credential dialogues. Uh, the other options uh, available are um, going low and slow, going low tech, and just searching disks for password files. That's you know unattended configuration files, um, login scripts, stuff like that. I mean, it's not sexy stuff, but it works and it's not going to get caught. It's, it just looks like normal traffic for the most part. All right, so finally, um, for me anyway, uh, stealing data and data loss prevention and stuff like that. Uh, we've had circumstances uh, where we get caught doing things that are just stupid, um, connecting to dozens of file shares and pulling back tons of files and stuff like that as a user that wouldn't normally do those kind of things. That's suspicious and, and can get you caught. However, if you pretend to be um, the backup service, and you invoke your SE backup privilege as the backup operator, then you can steal whatever you want, and for the most part, no one's gonna question it because it's just a normal backup. So a fantastic tool for that that's already on the box is RoboCopy. So RoboCopy with SE backup privilege is like the 400 pound hacker backup solution. So eh, definitely take advantage of it. Uh, it's a fantastic way to obtain data and, and uh, collect information. All right. Any questions? Rough quick. Ben, got anything else? I think so. All right. All right. So, so the closest we get generally is um, once they've rooted us out, they, they've, they've figured out where we are, they've, they've created their indicators of compromise and, and taken us out of the network at, at, from every place possible, then they just block our IP and they're done. There's no, yeah, they, they're, they're happy. And, uh, but again, that's, that's where you know, changing our C2 infrastructure now is, is important so that we can move on. Of course, we typically have more than one type of implant in place. So while they've burned us out this way, we've got our other callback that's waiting for us to... Uh... Okay, they feel good about themselves. They, they killed them now, but they must all be over. Right, yep. All right, thank you.